Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. Matthew chapter 24. We, this will be part two of us dealing with the darkened moon, or in this case, the moon turning to blood. Now, if you remember from last week, which there is a lot of mistakes on the original uh, posting of last week's video, so I had to go back and re-edit it. Um, but if you remember from last week's video, we talked about these people m making these outrageous claims about these four red moons and how that was going to be the start of everything and nothing happened. Well, I won't say nothing happened. These guys made a lot of money while they lied to everybody. But other than that, nothing happened. And it's because people have left believing the Word of God and they've left... I mean, if you're going to study Bible prophecy, let's make it Bible prophecy. Not the Book of Enoch prophecy, not Nostradamus prophecy, not internet prophecy. Let's make it the Word of God prophecy. So the things that I have been showing you for the last, well, let's see, 2000, since 2009, so that would be, what, 12 years? And up until today and throughout the future, hopefully, will always have as its basis the truths of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Let's pay attention to, what, to exactly what Jesus said. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. And we noted last week that the moon is always rendered in the feminine. Sun's always masculine. The moon is always a woman, a female. The moon, you know, the, Jesus could have said the way we say it. The moon will not give its light because to us it's a thing. But Jesus, the creator, actually knows more about the moon than NASA does, right? Because he created it. He knows what it is, how it is, why it does what it does, and so on. God knows all of these things. Jesus is God. And Jesus knew to call it a her. The moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. We'll, we'll deal with that in another watchman. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And again, I can't help but see the rapture, the translation, in that passage. Because we're gathered together, just like in the rapture, when? at the sound of a trumpet. The trumpet's going to sound, and Paul said it would be the last trump. That's a whole different Watchman broadcast series that we have done, may do it again. All right? But anyway, the focus today is this particular darkening of the moon, or let's say the moon turning into blood. Now, when it comes to the darkening of the sun, the darkening of the moon, the darkening of the stars, because those three all go together, whether it's Matthew 24, Mark 13, um, Isaiah 13, Joel, J uh, Revelation chapter 6, no matter what passage it's from, it's all three of those things together. The sun is darkened, the moon is is in one passage darkened, in another passage it has turned to blood, which that's darkening the moon, and the stars withdraw their light, or they are darkened, or in some references, some verses, 
they specifically fall, which is why they don't have light anymore, all right? And I didn't know this until I really started doing the research, but God had given warnings about what would happen in the day that the sun and the moon and the stars would all be darkened. First, let's look at Psalm chapter 72, verse 2, because he has a promise built upon the blessing of the sun and the moon. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy. I love our God. I, I do. I love our God. God doesn't care about the rich. Rich have everything they want. The God who created everything, who walks on streets of gold, the most richest entity in the universe, God, cares about poor people and orphans and little children and widows. And he teaches us to do the exact same thing thing, to care for the people who can't provide for themselves or who have nowhere else to turn. That's what, that's the God that we serve because we're those needy people who can't do for ourselves. God must do it for us. Amen. Uh, he shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy. He shall break in pieces the oppressor. And notice this verse five, they shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. Now look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes is Solomon who uh, God allowed to have, and I figured this out one day, God allowed Solomon to have everything that every man has ever lusted after or ever wanted in every man's life throughout history whether it was women, whether it was money, whether it was power, whether it was, you know, having a lot of cars, big house, property everywhere, you know, being the most powerful person, you know, being the, being the person that nobody, he doesn't, I don't, you know, he does Solomon didn't have to work for anybody. Everybody worked for Solomon. So Solomon actually had everything that we have ever lusted after. And in Ecclesiastes, he says, it was vanity. It was a waste. I had it for 40 years. I had this. I had parties. I had women. I had money. I had, you know, kings bowing down to me. Nobody would fight Israel because they knew that our God would kill them. There were countries, there were countries around the world that were paying taxes and levies to Israel because of Solomon, because of David. Okay, so now watch what Solomon at the end of his life now says from the man who has everything. This is what he says. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Now notice what he says. He mentioned the evil days Paul talked about that in Ephesians 6, the evil day, that you may be able to stand in the evil day. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. I think what he's saying here is, because Noah, Noah had a cutoff date, right? God went to Noah in, in Genesis 7 and said, Noah for yet seven days, then I'm going to cause the rain to come down upon the earth and the fountains of the great deep are going to open up. So for, the, for that week, seven days, that door, the ark was open and anybody who wanted to go in there and say, Noah, I, I, want, to be, I want to be with you. I, I believe what God said. I believe that, I believe that you didn't build this just on a whim, I think God's going to destroy the earth and punish the world for its iniquity and I want to be saved. 
I think anybody could have walked in there and been saved. But then at some point, there has to be a cutoff point. And there was. God said, for yet seven days, boom. And then he closes the door. God closed the door of the ark. Not man, not Noah. God did it. And so there is an evil day coming. And God said, and there is a time when the sun's going to be darkened, the moon, the stars, all of these things are going to take place on a certain day. And I believe that at a certain point, and I believe then it's going to be related to the sun being darkened, the moon turning to blood or the moon turning dark, the stars either withdrawing their shining or falling. I believe that day is the cutoff day. Because he says here, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened. Notice there's four things there. The sun, the light, the moon, the stars. Be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In other words, think Bible. Remember thy creator. Think Bible. Get saved before these things happen. Because I don't believe there's going to be a chance after these things happen. I don't believe there will be. We know the angels told Lot, Lot, you need to hurry up. God is going to destroy this city, but we can't destroy it as long as you're here. But you need to hurry up. And he had to literally push Lot along. And we know the story. Lot and his two daughters and his wife started to leave Sodom, but his wife turned around to look back at Sodom because she wanted to go back. Clearly, she wanted to go back. God turned her into a pillar of salt, and then he destroyed Sodom. You see, God cut it off right then. And Jude makes this point. God knows how to save the righteous. And he knows how to pour out wrath upon the ungodly. God knows how to do both. So remember your creator before the sun and the moon and the stars are darkened. See, I've read that verse before many times, but I never put it together with Matthew 24. Now I see it. Now I see it. Now I get it. God's telling us, get things right. Put your house in order, confess your sins, turn to Jesus with all your heart, be born again before it's too late, before the sun is darkened. Isaiah 60 verse 19, the sun shall be no more, no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. Now, if I'm right, if I'm right on how I see the timing of everything, then I believe we're going to see the sun go dark, the moon's not going to give its light, the stars are going to withdraw their shining, they're going to fall. We're going to see that. And I think Isaiah 60 verse 19 is telling us this, that's going to happen. I'm going to darken the sun. I'm going to darken the moon. I'm going to darken all the stars. Don't freak out. Because as of that point, I will be thy light. And if, if you don't believe that, we can go back to Genesis chapter 1. And I'll show you, you probably already know this. Uh, it was on day four that God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. So on day four of creation, he had the sun, the moon, the stars. But was there light in the earth before day four? Yes. Where did that light come from? God himself. Because in Genesis 1, Verse 3, God said, let there be light. And there was light. So even before the sun, the moon, and the stars, 
God was the light of the world. And he divided the light from darkness. Then on uh, day three, he's sowing grass and seed and trees. He's planting flowers everywhere. And we all know that they feed on sunlight, photosynthesis. They need light in order to survive. Well, God was that light. And the, well, there's a beautiful picture there. We need light to survive. Amen? Well, I'm, having, I'm having fun already. Okay? We're going to turn a little bit more serious. And you notice at the beginning of this particular watchman, I, I placed a warning that um, some of the content that I'm going to bring up here shortly may not be for all audiences. So uh, in just a, just a minute, I'm going to say what it is that I'm going to talk about. And you may not want, you know, some of your children hearing this. I'm not going to be vulgar or anything like that, but it is of a sensitive nature. And, uh, you know, I believe in being prudent in how I talk. God sort of taught me that over the years. It didn't used to be so much, but, you know, I believe in being prudent. But the topic that I'm going to bring up a lot that deals, I believe, with why the moon turns to blood is that we're going to learn a little bit about the female cycle. Okay? And God created all of that for His glory, for His honor. To, and what did He say about the sun, moon, and the stars? Um, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Four more things. Gospels here, right? Okay? And kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit, but what is that female cycle all about? It's about how God gives woman the ability to do something that no man can do. Bring forth life into this world. Amen? I love it. Absolutely love it. Okay? So God says to us, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 19, the sun's going to be darkened, the moon, forget about it. But don't worry. I'm going to be your light. You won't need the sun anymore. You won't need the moon. You won't need the stars. I am going to be thy light forevermore. And that's what we find in the book of Revelation in the new heaven and the new earth is that God is the light of that new Jerusalem and new heaven and new earth. God and God alone is the light of all of that. So that there is no dark. I don't think there's going to be any shadows either. Okay? I can't fathom that, but that's just what I think. So, We've, we've made mention that the, the sun is masculine. The moon, and you can check this out for yourself. The moon is always rendered as a female, as a her, as a she in the scriptures. And there's something, if you were to take the sun and the moon and, and compare them and think about them. One of the things that we know is different between the sun and the moon is that every day when the sun comes up, the sun looks like exactly what it did yesterday and a week ago and a month ago and a year ago and 40 years ago. In other words, the sun and its light has never changed. It's because it's God. And yet the moon... Well, it's changing all the time, isn't it? Okay. Uh, what does Proverbs say about the strange woman? Her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Talking about the paths of life. Okay. The moon is always changing. That's the female. The sun is static, the male. He never 
changes. The, the same sun that we look at now is the same sun they looked at 5,000 years ago, 5,500 years ago, the same one that Adam looked up and saw the sun. It's exactly the same sun. Now, here's what I mean by changing. We all know that the moon has phases. You have a new moon, which it's there. We just can't see it because it's darkened. And here in a little bit, I'm actually going to show you a video clip and, and I'll give the credit down at the bottom of where I got this video clip. I basically took my phone and just filmed it off the screen so YouTube wouldn't throw a fit over doing this because it's a copyrighted thing on YouTube. But it's a really neat graphic that explains why we have never, ever, ever from Earth seen the backside of the moon. We've only seen one face of the moon. So the moon's up there, but it's, it's black and we can't see it. That's the new moon. And then you have the waxing crescent moon, and it, we call it a thumbnail because it looks like you know, your thumbnail when it first starts coming out has that little arch there, white. The first quarter moon, the waxing gibbous moon, then the full moon, then the waning gibbous moon, third quarter moon, waning crescent moon, which is another thumbnail moon, and then it's gone again. And it repeats that cycle over and over and over again. Uh, yeah, you should probably should have known I was going to do this. Uh, Ecclesiastes, again, chapter 1. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down. This is verse 5. And hasteth to his place where he arose. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Verse 7. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Verse 9, the thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. So yeah, the moon constantly changes. It's in a constant state of change. Even on a full moon, it's only a full moon for like one night. And then the next day, there's the very faintest hint of a shadow there on one side of it. And again, here in a little bit, I'll show you a video of why it is that even though the moon spins, we still only see one face of it. And there's a point that I'm going to bring up in relation to that. So, and what it, and it's, this is the neat part of it. And I'm going to lay this out because there's an aspect of this that is in witchcraft that I'm going to show you in a little bit. And I believe it is important as it pertains to why the moon turns to blood. Again, I, I asked the question one Sunday in our church, and it was a trick question. Uh, you know, how many of you have read a verse in the Bible that says the moon's going to turn red and hands went up all over the building? And I said, no, you didn't. There is no verse in the Bible that says the moon's going to turn red. Now, it doesn't mean that there's never been a lunar eclipse where the moon's turned red because I've seen it. But God specifically said blood. We'll read the verses in a little bit. God specifically said the moon shall be turned to blood twice. And then he said as blood once. And he said that for a reason. I mean, he could have said the moon shall be turned red like a rose. Because roses are red, right? But he didn't say that. He specifically mentioned blood. If you remember what I said we're going to talk about and why this video is really not for children, you start to put the things together. Okay? So, 
Um, the moon orbits the earth, look up on the screen, every 27.3 days, which is like almost 28 days. In fact, the word moon is where we get the word month from because a month was based loosely upon the moon and its rotation and its cycle around the earth. How one day it's not there, 28 days later, it's there again, okay? Or 14 days later, it's there. Shining bright as can be. And then 14 days later, it's gone again, okay? So in its orbit, it's called a synchronous rotation. And as I play this video, you notice that they, the guy who did this animation puts a flag on the moon, on the face of the moon. Let's say that's Apollo 11, the first moon landing. And that red flag shows you that as the moon spins on its axis, it is also counter-rotating around the surface of the earth so that everybody, no matter where you are on the earth, you're only seeing one part of the moon at any given time. Now, to me, that's fascinating. Uh, it's, it's beyond fascinating. For nature to synchronize two objects that are 250,000 miles apart from each other. So far, the, approximately how far the moon is from the earth. Number one, for it to be the, in the sky, according to our perspective, for it to be the exact same size as the sun, <sighs> that tells me automatically it's deliberate. And then you add to it the idea that even though the moon is spinning on an axis, the fact of it is that because it spins in a synchronous rotation with its rotation around the earth is the reason why we only see one side of the moon. The fact that the moon is synchronized with the earth tells me that nature didn't do it to itself. It wasn't a happy accident. It wasn't a Bob Ross happy accident. It wasn't a scientific happy accident. God is the one that did that. He synchronized. Nobody up until, 19, I think it was 1958, the Soviets, they launched Sputnik. Then they sent a probe to the moon to take pictures to see what was on the back side of the moon. First time anybody in human history had ever seen what was on the back side of the moon. Now you think about that. It, if something rotates and you're standing there and you're watching it spin, you can see as it spins what's on all sides of whatever it is that's spinning. Like if it's a billboard or something like that, a sign or something like that, or a globe, you can see all of it. But because of the synchronous rotation and orbit of the moon around the earth, it's perfectly synchronized so that we can never see what's on the other side of the moon. We only see one side of the moon. For the last 6,000 years, throughout recorded history, no one had ever even known what the back of the moon looked like. It wasn't until, what was it, Apollo 8? It was the first lunar mission to send guys to the moon. They didn't land on the moon. That was Apollo 11. Apollo 8 was the first American attempt to go to the moon, orbit the moon, see what was on the backside. Um, Buzz Aldrin, here's a quote from him. Hello, moon. How's your old backside? 
he was he was curious. He wanted to see what was on the back side of the moon because he'd never seen it before. And to me, what's amazing is on the back side of the moon, it's got all these cra it's got millions of craters on the back side of the moon. That's because the moon is a shield for the earth. It's protecting the earth from all these meteorites. The moon is protecting this earth. God is protecting this earth through the moon with all these meteor strikes that would have hit the earth. They hit the moon instead. Now, there's a reason why I'm spending time on this synchronous rotation thing. How that the earth the moon's orbit around the earth takes 27.3 days and its own rotation takes also exactly 27.3 days exactly the same amount of time again nature couldn't have done that to itself only the hand the heavens show the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork for the moon's orbit around the earth and its own turning to be exactly synchronized so that man only sees one side of the, of the moon. To me, that is just fascinating. Okay, so let's bring in this issue of the woman cycle. Now, obviously... I am no expert on the woman's menstrual cycle. But I do remember a little bit from 10th grade biology, college biology, and things that I've learned being married to a woman for uh, some 30 plus years. Um, just a few things, okay? And that one of them is is that the way the moon cycle goes and the way the female cycle goes, they're synchronized. Let's go back to this image of the moon. You have the new moon. So let's say that that is the end of a woman's, we'll call it the, her period, the Bible calls it her sickness. She's unclean and there's an end to it. So now she starts all over again. And what's happening is from that day, the woman and the moon are waxing. Every day you get up or you go outside at night and you look up and you can see a little bit more of the moon each and every day. As the woman's cycle continues, her body is preparing her womb to receive an egg. And on the day that the egg shows up could be considered like the full moon because that woman now is ready to be fertilized so she can bring forth children okay Whew. a man talking about this okay I'm not used to this so but what happens in the case that that egg is not fertilized well, what happens is everything that was done for those 14 days to put that egg in its place for it to be fertilized now has to be undone. So that's the waning of the moon. And near the end of that waning process, both in the moon and with the woman, that egg is now dead. It's useless. It cannot be used. It doesn't just stay there. She is unclean and she and her womb need to be purified. What is it that purifies the woman's 
womb during that waning time. Blood. You see it now? And think of, think of blood now. Think of the symbol of blood in your Bible. And, and what does blood signify in the scriptures? Well, I, I've done a, a, a teaching, I've done it several times on human blood, what it does, how it's built up, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and so on. But let's take the white blood cells. The white blood cells are for the purification of the human body. Anytime something unclean enters into my body, a virus, a germ, or anything like that, my immune system through my white blood cells immediately attack what's causing the uncleanness or the sickness in my body. In other words, it is the blood. You know, years ago they used to suck blood out of people in order to make them well because they said, well, they got toxins in their blood. They got bad blood. We need to suck the blood out of it. That was ridiculous. Okay? Um, because it's the blood that was necessary to purify that body from any kind of uncleanness or sickness. And it's the blood of Christ that has cleansed and purified us all. Paul said in Hebrews, pertaining to the law and the ministry of the Levite priest in the sanctuary, he said almost everything back then was purified and sanctified by blood. So the, the woman's womb now has to be washed clean and made whole again. And it literally is in the blood. Isn't that neat? Okay. And th again, think about what that process is for. Is it just because God likes to laugh at women and gives them something to complain about? No. It has to do with the blessing of the desire of every woman to bring forth children. Look at what your Bible says. Deuteronomy 33, 14. And for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun and for the precious things put forth by the moon. Psalm 104, 19. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knoweth his going down. Isn't that interesting? The moon and the woman's cycle, her menstrual cycle, and I, if I remember right, even the word menstrual is linked to the word moon. You know, I study etymology and the root of words and so on. Because literally it's synchronized, it's about the same time frame as the waxing and the waning of the moon. And you have the waxing and the waning of the woman who's awaiting to be fertilized so she can bring forth children. And here in Deuteronomy, the precious, the precious things brought forth by the moon. What are those precious things? Children. Isn't that something? All right, now, watch this. So, in Matthew 24, Jesus said that the moon shall be darkened, or the moon shall not give her light. But in other verses, complementary verses to what Matthew 24 was saying, you know, the Bible can say the same thing, but say it differently in two different places. Like in Joel. Uh, when Joel said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered, is what Joel said. But Peter said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered saved. And that's also what Paul said. So it's using two different words, but that's the Bible's way of telling you they both mean the same thing. So in this case here, we have some of the verses saying the moon is darkened. We have other verses that say this. And I want you to think of 
what we just talked about, while I'm blushing here, okay, I'm glad there's, I'm glad I'm not seeing you face to face on this one. What we're, I want you to remember what we just talked about. The lunar cycle and the female cycle and its purpose. And remember what the purpose of the blood is in the female cycle. It purifies and sanctifies and cleanses the womb of the woman in preparation for the next cycle. Because maybe in that cycle, the woman will conceive and bring forth a child. Think of all the places in the Bible where you had a woman that could not conceive a child, but then did. God opened up her womb. Amen? Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will shew wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in, that, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Again, God could have said the moon shall be turned red, but he didn't say it. He could have said the moon shall be turned like a rose, but he didn't say it. He said the moon. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Why? Uh, Acts chapter 2. Peter says the same thing. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, watch this. Let's put these two things together. The, the purpose of the blood in the womb, washing and purifying the womb, is so that once that period is over with, then the womb can prepare to receive another egg to be fertilized. Conception. Birth. What is it to be saved? It means to be born again. Think about it. Born again and you know, don't misunderstand me. I am right now born again. I am right now a son of God. I just don't have the body yet. You see it? I'm still in the womb. I'm not ready to be birthed yet. I don't have my body, as it were. I still have this old, junky, smelly, by body that I've been dragging around now for 55 years. But at my second birth, when I die, I get this brand new body and I shall appear as the son of God. Wow. So think about this thought. Why is the moon turning to blood? Purification cleansing, sanctification. Why? Because there's some people who need to be born again. They're called the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, the Jews. I believe that when the Gentiles are translated, God's going to remove the veil and I've taught this for years. God's going to remove the veil 
that's over the Jews when they read the Old Testament and they're going to all of a sudden the light's going to come on and they're going to see that their Messiah really was Jesus Christ and they're going to believe it. A number of them, not all of them, but a number of them are going to believe it. So if you ask me, what's this whole blood moon thing about? I think it's about the birthing of a man child. Revelation 6, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. So three verses, out of the mouth of three witnesses shall every word be established. You have Joel 2, you have Acts chapter 2, you have Revelation 6. And all three of them are saying the moon's either turning to blood or as blood, but it's using, all three of them are using the phrase, the blood, the blood, the blood. Because of what the moon represents, it represents the female cycle, the waxing, the waning, and how in that process is how God has designed to bring forth a new man into this world. And that's what we are going to be. We are now and we are going to be one of these days, one new man. But in preparation for that, the womb has to be cleansed. And just generally, about how long does, and I'll say it this way, the blood purification process last in a female's body? One, two, three, four. For the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Could be. Could be a link there. Okay? Now, um, in the law, in the Old Testament, God used the female cycle and that purification by blood and what that blood represented, God used that as a symbol of something. Because if you wash, if you take a, a pot or a pan or a bucket of clean water and you take your dog and you wash your dog in that clean water and you take your dog out, what do you do with that water? That water's messed up, isn't it? You drink it? Ugh. 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 No, you don't, you don't drink that. That's disgusting. Because that blood now is defiled. The, wow. Mm. All of our sins, when Christ is on the cross, all of our sins are cast upon him. Now he's unclean, but not for his own, not because of his own doings. He's unclean because all of our sins are cast upon him. And it's his blood that washes away all of our sins. Now watch what God says pertaining to this menstrual blood and what it represents. Isaiah 64, 6, But we are, are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Isaiah 30, verse 21, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand, and when you turn to the left. Ye shall defile also the covering of thy graven images of silver and the ornament of thy molten images of gold. Thou shalt cast them away as a menstruous cloth. Thou shalt say unto it, Get thee hence. Look at that. Lamentations 1.17 Zion spreadeth forth her hands, and there is none to comfort her. 
the Lord hath commanded concerning Jacob that his adversaries should be round about him. Jerusalem is as a menstruous woman among them. You see, it pertains to uncleanness. And I like this verse in Isaiah 30, where Israel is finally, they, they finally get it. There is coming a time, there was a time in your life when you finally got it. Some of you used to be Roman Catholic. And you used to bow to images of gold and silver and ceramic and everything else in the world and pray to it because the priest told you to. And one day you took that, the Holy Ghost came in you, made you see things the way they are, and you took all of that doctrine that you had learned and you tossed it out like a maxi pad, like a menstruous cloth, you got rid of it because nobody keeps those, right? And that's what God is saying here. The menstruous cloth is defiled and filthy because it was used to purify and cleanse and sanctify the holy place of the womb. And now it's cast aside. Now you're clean. Mm, somebody say amen. Hebrews chapter 9, look at this. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall, look, look at this, the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Mm. Just like in the woman's womb. The blood is there as a purgative. It's there to purge and sanctify and cleanse what has now become, you know, what the egg represents was hope. But the egg wasn't fertilized, so now it has to be cast out. It's dead. It's the old dead works. It's the things that didn't work in your life. And it's the blood that washes and purifies and cleanses them. Just like in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews 9 verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Verse 22, and I mentioned this earlier, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. Think about it. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. It's the blood that sanctifies, cleanses. So that's why in the law, God told the Israelites when a woman is in the Bible uses the term her sickness. When the woman is in that time, she's unclean. Her husband may not approach unto her. She is to be set aside. <sighs> Talking about unclean women. You remember Rachel? When Laban came after he had found out that somebody had stolen his idols, it was Rachel that did it. Jacob is um, well on his way with his two wives. Laban comes up riding up and he says, I'm here to kill somebody. Jacob said, Who, what have we done? He said, somebody stole my images. And he said, I'm going to search every tent. I'm going to look at every camel. I'm going to look at everything you've got, and whoever I find that has it, I'm going to kill him. Well, it was Rachel. But here's what Rachel did. Watch this. 
she hid them in a cabinet or something like that from that they put on the camel for the camel to carry she hid them in there and then sat upon them and when Laban came in saw his daughter sitting there on that chest and he said get up I gotta search you that and she said uh, I can't for it is after the manner of all women with me in other words I'm having my you know and, and dad's going oh uh, okay because he's like me and it's like I don't want to I don't want to know I don't want to hear this I don't want to know about it nothing the law said that every place when a woman is in her sickness she is unclean and every place that she sits is unclean and those idols that Rachel was protecting defiled now because she's unclean mystery Babylon sits on seven hills doesn't she and because she is an unclean woman everything she sits on is now unclean because that blood has been defiled now because the blood was the cleansing agent of the woman's womb mm -mm -mm. without shedding of blood is no remission of sins now Take a look at these symbols here that I have up on the screen. You re have you ever seen any of these before? These are the symbols of Wicca. Wicca is, Wicca draws from the same word, wist, W-I-S-T. When Jesus said, wist ye not that I must be about my father's business. Wist means knowledge or wisdom. The word witch, wicca, wizard, they all come from the same source that means like a secret, not, we, we know things that you don't know. We have a secret knowledge, in other words, that's what it means. And notice that they use the symbol of the waxing, the full, and the waning moon. As their, as their number one sign. And it's because they believe that their goddess, the one they worship, is the moon. They worship the moon. And now, again, think about what we've equated that, that with in this broadcast. The uncleanness of the woman's cycle. You know, God instructed us not to drink blood, not to eat blood, eat anything with the blood in it. Remember that? All through the law, Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, he told us that. Jezebel in Revelation 2, that, that self-appointed prophetess who causes God's people in that church to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to drink blood and all that stuff. Remember her? You know what is done? in some satanic covens and witches covens in their ceremonies they will drink a drink called ambrosia ambrosia is the liqueur of the gods it's what makes the gods immortal you want to take a guess at what kind of blood they use yep that's disgusting. It's sick. But it shows you how evil these people are. This book called Moon Magic of the Triple Goddess. Wiccan moon, rituals, lunar spells, and drawing down the moon. Drawing down the moon. Now what does that mean? Well, I have a book called The Complete Idiot's Guide to Wicca and Witchcraft. And here's what it says. Many witches draw down the moon during esbats. It's like a Sabbath. When you draw down the moon during a full moon ritual, you pull the energy of the goddess to yourself. To do this, picture yourself standing in a field. Above you, the full moon is glowing brightly, or go out actually and stand in the light of the full moon. A lot of people do this. Gaze at the moon and assume the goddess position, feet apart, 
planted firmly on the floor, arms raised up until they are over your head, elbows slightly bent. Picture white light streaming from the moon down through the night sky and unto you. Everyone's experience of drawing down the moon is somewhat different, but everyone agrees that it is a powerful experience. The first time Denise drew down the moon, she had no idea what, what it was going to be like. She felt a strong tingling in her hands and feet and around her mouth. The sensation spread up her limbs as if she had millions of ants crawling on her, and it intensified to the point where she became frightened. She took a little gasp of air, and in an instant, the feeling vanished. For six months after that, every time she tried to draw down the moon, she was unsuccessful. In other words, she was calling in familiar spirits, devils, to come in and give her this sensation is what she was doing. Then it says, after you have drawn down the moon and are filled with the goddess's energy, you can do magic or you can just enjoy the deep connection that you will feel with her. Afterward, you will feel cleansed and replenished. You probably won't need to draw down the moon every month, but it's great to do it if you're feeling drained or empty. If you've been doing a lot of magic, helping people and healing them, you'll probably want to draw down the moon to recharge and replenish your energy from the goddess and endless source. In terms of ritual structure, you draw down the moon after you have cleansed and consecrated your space, cast the magic circle and called the quarters and the god and goddess. In a coven, the high priestess draws down the moon. When she has done that, she is seen to have become the goddess. Stop right here. What was it Lucifer said? Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Mm. Some high priestesses will share the goddess's energy with the coven members and others will not. As a solitaire, in other words, a single witch without a coven, you get to experience the direct connection with the goddess that is reserved in many covens for the high priestess alone. In some traditions, only the high priestess, as opposed to the high priest, can draw down the moon. So they're using moon magic and everything that we've said today that the moon and its waxing and its waning and its cycles, everything that it represents, including, get ready for this one, you remember that I said that the earth and the moon are in a synchronous cycle. In other words, the moon's turn on its own rotation and its orbit around the earth, both of them are exactly 27.3 days or almost 28 days. Exactly. In other words, they're synchronized. Watch this. Have you ever noticed that a woman's menstrual cycle is about the same length as the moon's 29 and a half day cycle? Many female witches pay close attention to the relationship between their own personal cycles and the phases of the moon. Some witches have been known to use magic to sync their menstrual cycle to the moon cycle so that they will bleed on the full or the new moon. That's just evil. You can do very powerful magic if you have your period on those nights. But what did God say? God said, you're unclean. God said, your works were as filthy rags. God said that you're going to defile your images and you're going to cast them away from you as a menstruous cloth. And here the witches are praising what God called uncleanness. Mm. Many witches feel that a woman's intuition is at its peak at the time of their menstruation. Others feel that the days leading up to menses the premenstrual phase is one of super sensitivity and powerful intuition. They feel they have prophetic dreams and can better channel energy during those few days of the month than at any other time. And I, I guarantee you, 
that kind of stuff is in some churches right now. I can almost guarantee you it is. Now, take a look at this. The blade and the chalice. Remember what the cycle is all about. The moon phase, the woman's cycle. It's about new birth. Bringing forth the man-child. Being born again. Right? There is an actual ceremony that witches do. Satanists do it. Pagans do it. Pe pagan religions, indigenous religions from places around the world for thousands of years. People would go out into fields like on a full moon and commit acts of fornication out in the field in order to honor the fertility goddess so that their crops would grow. Not making this up. So in witches' covens, they have a ritual called the blade and the chalice. Chalices represent the female. They're used to, again, this is from the Complete Idiot's Guide for all the idiots who want to become Wiccans. They are used to drink wine from during ritual. Sound familiar? A chalice is also used in doing the great rite, a symbolic unification of the male and female in which an athame, which is a sword or a, a large knife, a blade, is lowered into a chalice. What does that signify? Think about it, but not too long. Many witches own more than one. You always seem to find a great one that you just must have. Keep an extra inexpensive one on hand in case someone in ritual doesn't have one. In other words, keep an extra one around because this ritual is so important. Whoever doesn't practice it won't get some kind of great magic spirit on them. Now, what is that great right ritual in relation to Scripture? I believe it's related to Daniel chapter 2 and that fourth kingdom where they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. In masonry, I probably need to teach this again. It's been years since I've talked about masonry. But in masonry, remember, the earth, what's down here, notice the magician tarot card. He's got a hand pointing down to the earth and a hand pointing up toward the heaven. He has the what looks like a sideways eight over his head, and it literally is. It's called the infinity symbol. And he has a sword and a chalice and a pentagram on his table. Okay. Oh, oh, did you see the blade that this witch is holding? You see the DNA on it? Da, da, da. Yeah. I believe that from their perspective, it represents the fourth kingdom and the coming of the fourth kingdom where they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Because Manly Hall... And Albert Pike, they all, all the Masons said the same thing. The earth represents the female, the, the passive. The heavens represent the masculine, the active principle. Yang and yin, negative and positive, black and white, coupling together to mingle themselves directly into the seed of men. Starting to hopefully make sense to you. When that moon turns to blood, it's a sign of something. Now, that female cycle They call it the curse. They call it a lot of other things. 
One of these days, God's going to give victory over that. Remember what women represent in the Bible. They are a type of the church or a church. If it's a bad woman, it's Jezebel, it's Mystery Babylon the Great, it's the mother of harlot churches. But if it's a pure woman, a saved woman, it's Jerusalem above. Now watch this. Revelation 12. Remember what I said this is all leading up to. What's the purpose of the female cycle? It's about birthing a child, isn't it? It's the ultimate of the desire of a woman is to give birth to a child. Revelation 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth. First Thessalonians chapter 5. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before... See, the stars are falling now, aren't they? Watch this. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for, her, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Notice this woman now has the moon under her feet. Why? Anything under your feet you now have dominion over. Think about what we did July 20th, 1969. We put a United States flag and a man's footprint on the moon. But in this case, it's God giving the church, his church, his bride, her final victory over all of her suffering. Remember the curse of the woman of, of Eve in Genesis 3 that Part of that curse was that she was going to be in pain in childbirth. And everything related to childbirth, including the cycle. Horrible things. But one of these days, it's going to be under your feet, ladies. God's going to give you victory over it. Mm. And the devil's going to lose the war. And he's going to cast a third of the stars out of the heavens. But a man-child is going to be born. The devil wants to devour him as soon as he's born. But what happens to him? He's caught up. Because he is going to rule. Think of Moses. Did the devil try to kill Moses when he was a baby? Yes. Think about Jesus at his first coming. Did the devil try to kill Jesus at his first coming when he was a baby? Yes. Second coming. Notice it says that he shall rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's Psalm chapter 2, verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Revelation 19, 15. Out of his mouth goeth the sharp that With it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now look at Revelation 2, 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter. They be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my father. Think about it now. Who did he say is going to rule with a rod of iron? Is it going to be Jesus or the church? Both. Both. He that overcometh is his bride, the church. Christ overcame by suffering on the cross. We take up our cross daily and follow him and we will overcome and when we do, we're going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. 
So this baby in Revelation 12 that's caught up, who is it? Is it Christ? Yeah. Who else is it? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Same exact word, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I believe it's us. So the idea of the moon turning to blood, it has to happen. It represents the purification, the sanctification, the cleansing. And then after, it's only after that that God sends forth his angels with the great sound of a trumpet to gather together his elect to be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. I'm looking forward to that day. I am. But before that day, one more thing has to happen. The stars, they have to fall, and they're going to. And we'll look into that the next time, all right? God bless you. You're the reason why we do what we do here at Bethel. We thank you. We want to encourage you to pray for us always and to remember the people, the hungry people in Turkana that we're trying to feed. Remember them and pray for them. And let God lead you if you decide to help us out with that ministry. May the Lord bless you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.